Welcome, Thrill Seekers, to um, the 12th CASI Connect event and the final event for the year. And I came across this young lady through some research that I was doing, and I was absolutely excited to get in contact with Sophie Underwood for the terrific work she does with the Bookla very talented lady and uh, she was very kind to participate in our Cassie Connect tonight and joining her will be our Geoffrey Conahan and um, he's a researcher and custodian of the traditional costumes from the uh, excuse my pronunciation but I'm going to give it a go at Sikis is that right uh, Geoffrey? Uh, the, the Eskites and Stavrianus families. Yes, and the family and is the family wardrobe custodian of the largest single collection of 80 items of Castellarisian clothing. So Sophie tonight, who is a very talented artist, will be taking us through her wonderful artworks and what's inspired her. And Jeffrey will be talking to Sophie about that and its connection to the wonderful Cassie costume. So I'll hand over to you both and hopefully you guys will thoroughly enjoy this because I've been really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Lena. And uh, Sophie, good evening. I'm, I'm currently in St Kilda at the moment in, in Melbourne, um, in Boonwurrung country. Uh, where are you? Uh, I'm on the east coast of Tasmania. Hello, everybody. Uh, and I am on Turano Mary Mina country, which is Freysenay Peninsula. The Freysenay Peninsula uh, out, out east. Um, thanks for that. Now, um, tonight um, we're going to be speaking to you about your, the, your body of work called Bukla um, uh, in the context of you being an artist. However, you've done a number of other things other than your arts practice. Um, Sophie, before we, we dive into Bukla, the body of work that you've completed, can you tell us a little about your professional background? Sure. And uh, first of all, I just want to apologise for my um, lack of lighting. Uh, I'm in a very old house and it's got very limited lighting, so hence why I'm a little bit um, dark. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so I've grown up in Tasmania and uh, I ha uh, have a background um, in geography, environmental studies and botany. And I wrote my honours thesis on the vegetation of the west coast of Flinders Island, of the limestone soils, and have probably about 10 years um, background in um, natural resource management. And then I've also worked in federal parliament for four years and currently I uh, am involved with two organisations. One's called the Planning Matters Alliance, um, uh, which is an advocacy group, and another which is called the Press and Action Network, which is also an advocacy group. And so uh, I am employed by those, those groups, um, which are purely crowdfunded. Right. So, so yeah, sorry. So those, those, those groups are largely involved with natural heritage, cultural heritage, um, and also residential issues. Well, um, I'd like to, uh, before we morph into your Greek background, and let's just, we know that your heritage is also Castellarisian. Um, I'd actually like to dive straight into your work and um, ask, are you ready? Um, to show us a little bit now um, before I ask you about your exhibitions. Have you, have you got that set up ready to go? Yeah, so what I thought that I've only just got a couple of images to start with and then when we go talk more, I'll give you more, um, show you in more detail. So um, I'm just going to share the screen, so bear with me, everybody. Um, so this is, this is the exhibition that I've recently had in Tasmania. Um, can everyone see that? Uh, that photo? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So this are... is. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead. You you explain. Oh, okay. So um, this is the first time um, Bootler was shown, uh, and it was at a 
Gallery 71 in the city of Hobart. And um, this is just a, a really a glimpse of my um, collages. Uh, so there were seven in this exhibition. And um, I'll just give you another, just another shot here. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this just gives you an overall perspective. So I actually had eight, um, no, seven collages in the exhibition, The Colours of the Rainbow, um, including pink, which is not shown here, uh, which I'll show you a bit later. So that, yeah, that just gives you an overall feel for my work. Good. Well, now, now that we've had a look at them, people get the idea. I, I think the frames are about 750 uh, um, millimetres square. Um, they're quite substantial works. And as you said, um, they are in the colours of the rainbow. But um, before we go on and talk about the work um, specifically, you've, you've just had your second booklet exhibition in one year. You mentioned the first one at the private gallery in Hobart, but you've just closed a six-week exhibition in Alveston in a public gallery. Um, that's quite an achievement for an artist in one year. Um, how, how was it received? Well, um, it, it, so I've had two, as you said, I've had two exhibitions this year. And so um, I have never shown my work publicly before. So I had my uh, debut as an artist and launched myself into, as a solo, in a solo exhibition. So it was quite an ambitious project. Uh, and so that was very well received in Hobart. Um, and because of that exhibition, I was then um, unexpectedly offered um, quite a significant opportunity in a public gallery to re-show the work in a new uh, gallery that's in Alverston, um, which is Northwest Tasmania. It's a new cultural art precinct, which was opened at the end of last year. It was about a $12 million project. So it's quite a significant building. And um, yeah, fantastic opportunity, but also um, helped make, was made into reality also with the support of Jeffrey, um, because we actually showed some of his collection um, as part of the exhibition, his clothing um, collection. Yes, I, so, I suppose I should have done a disclaimer um, up front that I've seen both of your exhibitions. I'm a yes. fan. And uh, for, for the one in Alveston that ran for six weeks, I lent part of the my my family's Castellarisian clothes. So, um, Sophie, one of the things that struck me that we don't get in Melbourne, but we, we got in both Hobart and Alveston, is that the vast majority of your your audience was non-Greek. So, in fact, you were um, while you were introducing them to your body of work, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You were also introducing them to an island they'd never heard about. Yeah. And a, a, a an object, the bukla, that of course they wouldn't have heard about either. In fact, a lot of uh, Greeks who are not a, not from Gustavus so have never heard of a bukla because it's it's unique. Now, um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? The whole experience of um, showing a body of work and revealing a, a Greek island to a, an, an audience that had no idea. Yeah, well, I think because because of my work in Tasmania, I do have a, a profile and a, a media profile, and I do have a very big network. So there was or a lot of interest because no one knew that I also privately made art um, or am an artist, and so there was a lot of interest because of that, um, and that was also part of the reason why I decided to make a book to support my exhibition, um, which was a series of photographs called Bukla to show the cultural context of my work to Tasmanians who have no idea about um, Castellaries and culture. And um, so I think there was a lot of interest because people uh, were interested in what I was doing. Uh, but the other fantastic thing for me was, was to have members of the Castellaries and the community come from Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Canberra to see the exhibition as well. So. It was, and Nick Bogiatis opened it in Hobart and Jeffrey kindly opened the exhibition in Alveston. And yeah, to have that element there was really fantastic. Um, yeah, so I think people were just really intrigued with the story more than anything, but have no, had no understanding of 
even where Castellarizo is, um, because so that's why I included a map as part of the exhibition. Yes. Um, just for, if people didn't see that before, I'm holding up your book, a substantial book that you referred to called Bookla, which is about not only your work, but the, the island's clothing and jewellery, um, from where, of course, your exhibition takes its name. Um, and I was amused that you did have a very large map on the wall with a, a red arrow. Um, this, you know, point here to Castellores on people, people really had no idea. Now, um, we've had a look at your work framed and we'll, we'll see a little bit more about it. But Sophie, could you describe um, the materials? Because on approach, they look like paintings, um, but they're not. So could you could you tell people about how, um, the materiality of, of these um, large works? Sure. Uh, so each collage is about 75 centimetres in diameter. And they're made up of individually hand cut flowers. And um, I've sourced those flowers from, um, from op shops and markets um, and some antique shops. And they are a collage, a collage of um, embroidery, applique and fabric. So I have been collecting flowers on uh, flowery material for um, over 10 years and uh, yeah so then each collage is made up of individually hand cut flowers and I've also dyed some of the hand dyed some of those as well as re-embroidered some of them uh, as and and also I've painted them so yeah so some people people can't really tell what they are until you have a really close look from afar they look um, they do look like paintings but they're they're not I, um, I, I got to spend quite some time in Ulverston with them because I was part of, I, I went down to assemble the clothes. So I was part of a team of five people that put your exhibition together. Um, the work is meticulous and very fine. Um, how long did each bookla take to make? I mean, you've said they're 75 centimetres in diameter. Well, if I was a full-time artist and I wasn't having to juggle my normal work as well as being a mother, and we also run a small business, um, it would be a lot quicker. Uh, so, and some of the pieces in this in this in Bookla exhibition have been made twice. Um, so, yeah, it's been a very it's been an unfolding process, and so it's really hard to say how long it takes. But probably, if I was working on it full time, it might take a month, maybe. Um, but this current, the booklet took me over 10 years to, yeah. to make amongst everything else that I was doing. Yeah, but um, yeah, I've just started to work on two other pieces and um, yeah, so and then my, one of them was will be the biggest one I've created today, It'll be 1.2 metres in diameter. Um, so I imagine that might take me another six, seven, eight months to complete that. So um, Sophie, what, why the name Bookla? Um, how did you how did you get to to this point? I mean, they they are round floral discs. Uh, um, they are heavily decorated in their foliage. Um, they do resemble uh, the Bookla. How did you get here? Do you mean with the name of the exhibition? Both the name of the exhibition and the 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 mandala circular and that's mandala not mandili everybody the the indian mandala disc but so the um, name shape. well i guess um i know you're going to be asking another question around what my story is and so maybe i'll go into more of that detail then but with regards to the Bookla name for the exhibition, it, it was interesting. It was a, it's been such a long unfolding process to get to this point. And, um, you know, first of all, you know, coming from a situation where I had no idea about my heritage or where I was from, but I was creating these images that I put, didn't understand. And, um, and then slowly over time, I, I learned where I was from. I learned about the Bookla and, 
over a long period of time, I then brought that story together and realised that I had been creating the main symbol of what essentially I'd been looking for, which is where I was from in Greece. And, um, and it may seem really obvious now that the booklet should be the name of the exhibition, but it took me a long time to come to that point. So I first was going to call my exhibition Transmutation because it was about change and um, understanding and becoming something new. And then I realised um, around the notion of the power of place across space and time. So, in other words, my place I feel manifested in me without me knowing where I was from. So that is the power of place across time and geography. So I was going to call it booklet, the power of place across time, uh, the power of place across space and time. And then, um, and then I thought, I'm just going to call it Bookla. I'm so pleased you did. And one, <laughs> one, of, uh, one of the reasons that um, I immediately fell in love with this exhibition is, and your work is that you have revitalised and refreshed and completely modernised references to our classic, as you said, um, si uh, unique symbol of, of the of the costume. So yeah. um, mm. uh, it and it. Um, I think we should now dip in for the audience to talk about you discovering your Castellarisian uh, background, um, particularly in the context that you've been designing these large discs of floral patterns for years before um, Castellarizo became part of your identity. So, yeah. So, what's your story? <clears throat> well, um... I see, with regards to Bukla, um, I see the manifestation of that exhibition as being the result of two different stories um, that came together in an unexpected way. And one of those stories is my own personal story. Um, and then um, the other part of that is my artistic story um, and my journey as, as becoming an artist. Um, so I was adopted in Tasmania um, in 1971 um, uh, into a fantastic, a wonderful family here. My father was a lawyer and then became the Chief Justice of Tasmania and then became the Governor. Um, and then my mum, she was eighth generation Tasmanian, also of, um, from Governor Sorrell. Um, and my mum started the first community school in Tasmania called the Bell Reef Cottage School. And that was a, there was a big focus on um, creativity, uh, especially, um, and I learned to embroider. I spent a lot of my childhood doing embroidery, working with colour. Um, yeah, I was always really creative. Um, and then um, skipped through many, many years and I had my first child, um, Rose, in 2009. And when she was born, um, I really wanted to know what my story was what my story was. So I had actually met my birth mother um, when I was 21, um, but had always grown up knowing that I, knowing that I was Greek and that I had a, a Greek father. Um, so I was half Greek, but I had no idea where I was from. And, um, and so when Rose was born, I didn't want her to inherit those same questions. So I guess the question around my heritage became really important to me. And that's when I really started trying to find out my story. And um, two years after Rose was born, I then also decided to go to art school. Um, and, and before that, I'd, been in, I'd come straight from um, federal parliament working for a senator uh, and then had a baby. In the so it was quite a, a big change in terms of, you know, the direction that I was going in. And, um, and, and then at art school, I started creating these round circular flowers, um, you know, decorations with flowers. And that was my main um, work I did for <clears throat> my photography. And it just continued on from there. Um, but at the same time, I was having this parallel journey of really trying to locate my heritage. And... Um, uh, it was not possible, basically. I sort of come to the end of the road and there was nothing I could do. There's a few bits of information that I knew. There were a bit of a few clues, but that sort of led me nowhere. So I kind of had nowhere to go and gave up in a way. And then I heard about Ancestry.com um, and then did a test 
And then in 2017, um, I found out that I was from, I found out my um, family tree and I still didn't know from that where I was from because it doesn't mean anything to me or that I can't even pronounce the names <laughs> of the people in my family tree. Um, so, yeah, and then it was through uh, someone else who made contact with me by Ancestry that I learned that I was from Castelfarizzo. So that was um, in February 2017. Um, that was a really amazing day for me, um, having not known where I was from for, um, uh, for most of my life. And um, yeah, it was fantastic. Um, and then I started learning about the Castorism heritage and doing a lot of reading. Um, but at the same time, I was creating these um, round mandalas full of flowers. And I spent about eight or nine years, um, I think it was something like that, trying to understand what I was making. Um, because Mr. Walsh, who started Mona here, uh, who owns the museum in Tasmania, um, said something like, artists never understand their work. And so I was determined to understand my work. And so I spent so many years researching um, the symbolism of flowers, um, colour, um, the power of archetypal images, um, the things that universally connect us as human beings. Um, and also my artwork has been influenced by my dreams, so I did doing, was doing a lot of research on that. Um, so, and at one point I actually wrote in my journal, um, I wonder if my, and I can't remember when I wrote this, I need to go back and find it in my journal, I wonder if my, the search for my birth father is linked to my creative expression. So I actually sort of had this unconscious awareness about I must have to have written that but that's all I sort of wrote and then um and then I discovered Cassie graphics and so I bought some um images from them including an image of the bookla and I was showing my work to someone one day so my collages and um and then I said oh you know I've just learned I'm from this place and look at this amazing beautiful image of the bookla and they said to me have you realized how similar your work is to the bookla and I was I was actually shocked I it was it was I hadn't even realized well so, Dave, and I yeah Dave, so Dave Walsh from Mona might be in fact very correct that artists never understand their work others have to point these things out to them that's very very yeah. interesting yeah, um, agree. Hmm. yeah so it's like it was so obvious um that it, and it was in front of me, but there's no way I ever would have worked it out. But then the other thing I did was in 2021, um, Nick Bogiatis, um went to South Australia to give a talk to the Castoreason Association of South Australia. And Liz, who I had, Liz um, Filippo, I'm not pronouncing any of these names correctly, I know, um, very kindly asked me to come over because I was, I contacted her through Facebook and I said, oh, Nick Bogiatis is coming to speak. Can you Facebook Live it so I can watch it? I really want to listen in. And she said, no, I can't. And, I, I, and then I contacted her again. I said, I can help you do it. It's really easy. <laughs> and then she said, well, why don't you fly over? And I was like, yeah, why don't I? And so the main reason I wanted to listen to that talk was to, uh, um, and Liz also I got, um, offered me the opportunity to meet Nick, um, which was fantastic. So I wanted to ask Nick, if that bookle image was found anywhere else in the world. And it was Nick who confirmed that it wasn't. And um, I've actually got that moment on video because I, I videoed what he was, because I asked if I could video what he was telling me. So it was just really an amazing um, moment for me, meeting Nick and getting that confirmed and, and realising that the, there was some, some, some substance, I guess, to his connection between my work and the island. Yes. In fact, um, the, uh, the British um, uh, archaeologist and, well, he was actually a looter, Mr Fellows, who visited Augusta Lorizo in the yeah. 1830s, yeah. noted that the, uh, that the women of the island wore uh, clothes distinctive to the island and he actually described the bookla. So um, the first um, 
rec record in in English of the bookler being worn from the from the eighteen thirties. Um, and according to him, it was it was distinctive. He he travelled extensively through uh, Greece yeah. and stealing things to take back to the United Kingdom. Um, uh, so um, uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, and I talked to Nick about that, and and he showed me the picture. I'm pretty sure it was that person who, and there was a drawing. I think that's what you were referring to. Yes. And he said that 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 would have been hundreds of years of women doing that, you know, wearing that the the bookler. Yes. So the fact that he was drawing it then um, meant that it must have been going on for a long time. A long time. So, yeah, and that's why it was it's really interesting for me that because my work, um, my advocacy work is around place and connection and cultural heritage and natural heritage, it was interesting, really interesting for me that that I always imagine landscapes being, and you see that through Aboriginal art, um, being translated through people's artwork as a landscape, but I never imagined that clothing or um, bricks and mortar, as it were, um, could be translated through time and space and through, um, you know, and Nick talked about this at the opening of Brooklyn and Hobart, you know, is it, is it cultural memory? Is it blood memory? Um, you know, what is it that's, and I, you know, come down through and manifest it in this way. And then later on, I, and I, it wasn't until really after the second exhibition this year that I began to understand it as an example of living culture. So... Well yeah. Um, Sophie, I think, have you got any more, um, because we've been doing a lot of talking and I think yeah. before we see it, what about some more images of these spectacular sure. works? Um, okay, just bear with me, everyone, while I just open this up. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, oh. Yeah, actually, before I, I'm just going to show you these ones first. These aren't particularly exciting, but it's, just interesting. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these are the these are the ones that I first started with at art school, and we had to work. Um, oops. Let's do this. We had to work in black and white at art school, um, and so this is where it sort of started. So this was in twenty eleven. Yes. And. Um, I was using different kinds of fabrics at this point and more modern fabrics. Over time, I started creating ones with, which were much older, um, but still some of them were old. Um, so that that was the that's how it started. And even like this this project um, took a while to get to this point. Um, and my lecturer at the point at the time was saying said to me, "Just keep going." You know, yes. she's like, I wonder what these would look like in colour. And I was like, yeah, I wonder. And anyway, so that sort of, it started from that project. Um, and I'm just going to go out of that one and just go back into a different lot and show the work of Bookler. Um, so bear with me for a second. Screenshot, I stop. Okay, so hopefully this is going to work. Okay, so... For some reason, um, I really want, and I talk about this, so the exhibition also includes a written component. Um, so it has um, a series of uh, seven collages, as well as a big print of a bookla, which I had enlarged to be the same scale as the collages, because um, I just wanted to show that comparison. It also includes a map, um, the book, and, and a written component, as I said. And I had this strong desire to make the rainbow, but I replaced indigo um, with pink because um, so, I love pink. Um, so um, anyway, I'll take you through. So this is the this is red, and you are, this is in the rainbow sequence. Um, and these these are these are photographs of the actual framed um, images. So I have used high quality art glass to reduce reflection, but it does give you an idea. So you can see the yes. reflection on the side, but at least it gives you an idea of the work. Um, here's the orange one looking quite 70s. Uh, and so some of the some of the work's much more detailed, and this one's the, you know just used bigger flowers. Um, but others um, 
uh, they're much more detailed. So this is the beginning. So this is, uh, so what I do is I collect the flowers, which can take a really long time. And I've been collecting them, as I said, for over 10 years now. And then I individually cut them out and then I put them into containers and work out different colours and sizes and that kind of thing. So that's the beginning process. Um, and then I begin to glue them on and this is me painting back into it. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll rework some of the flowers. Um, it's me in my studio, living room. Um, so this is the yellow one. Lots of people really love the yellow one. So it's much more detailed than um, than the orange one. That, um, what, Sophie, one of the things that I've found remarkable is that yeah. you've actually um, unconsciously nailed the colours used in the Castellarisian women's costume and also that extraordinary preference for floral patterns. Um, yeah. Certainly over either solid colours or geometric. Um, yeah. So we're, as you're flicking through these, we get the greens, yellows, orange, red, um, uh, almost vermilion blue um, of of the women's clothing, which is quite remarkable. Um, yeah. So yeah. the um, uh, how does an artist secure an exhibition? You just breezed over the fact that you, you've had two in one year. Um, yeah. I've quite a few artists um, getting two in. Two years is hard work. Um, how do you secure an exhibition? And are we going to see the, so that's the first part, are we going to see you in Melbourne? Well, I'd love to come, I'd love to show my work in Melbourne. Um, but can I just show the rest of these photos quickly? Yep, let's move through them because we'll be going to questions soon. Okay, sure. So yes, um, beautiful the green. Um, this is starting the blue. Ah, look at that. Um, this is early collecting, um, so that's the purple. And this is the pink. Um, there's a bit of glare in that, but um, I think I think people you an get idea, that. and that's yeah. Um, um, and these they, these are just to remind people um, seventy five um, uh, seventy five centimeters wide. Those uh, pieces and oh, can you talk about this new work? This is your latest. Um, yeah, so this, this piece of work here actually was the first one, a big one I did in colour. It doesn't exist anymore. I pulled it apart. Ah. Um, and I pulled it apart to make all the other ones. But this was this was the beginning of um, this unfolding process as well. So that was the first big one I did. Uh, I just wanted to include this is part of the exhibition we had at Hive where um, Jeffrey generously um, loaned some of his beautiful collection. It was so amazing. Um, and this is the big print of the bookler. Um, so that's actually the same scale as the other, and that just shows the detail. And this see. is a, this you've had this um, uh, photograph by one of um, Australia's leading art photographers, I yeah. understand. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you've you've donated this for the dinner on Saturday night. Is that correct? Uh, yes. It, yeah, it, ah. it will be. Um, at the, yeah, they've got a print to to auction. Um, and that's the book, which you've already seen, um, map. That was just to oh, yes. show people. There's the Castellarizo. Um, and this is just some of the big new work. So this is one I'm doing at the moment, which is called Colours of the Heart. Oh. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, there's, but there's, there's another one I'm doing as well. So I'm just going to come so out these, of that. These are, these are major works. And um, uh, how... How how could you get an exhibition in Melbourne? Sorry, how how could yeah. we? Yeah, um, I um, I know it took five people uh, three days to put this exhibition together in in Hobart to do it in in, in Alveston rather to do it yeah. properly with well, lighting and um, all of the you know there was a technical team okay a technical team of four and me uh, so I was the fifth person um, how how can we see them here? Well, the one in Hobart was a lot easier. I mean, it just depends on what, what I would show if it came to Melbourne. Um, so if it had clothing in it, for example, it would be take longer to hang. than Like the one in Hobart took the afternoon to do. But what about um, securing things like um, securing space and getting a, ga getting a gallery? Um, what, uh, how, how, 
how complicated is that? Well, it's I've never done it before, obviously. So, um, and uh, it's establishing some kind of relationship with a space in Melbourne. Um, that the idea the idea had been floated about the Immigration Museum. I think that would be a fantastic um, fit. Um, so yes. it's a matter of contacting someone there and seeing if there's an, any opportunity for um, a space at some point. Um, and I do have an arts advisor in Tasmania who advises me on all things art because um, I'm new to this world. Um, so, and she's got connections there. Uh, but it doesn't have to be there. Um, and so, yeah, just a matter, I guess, if there's interest from the Castorism community in Victoria, um, but there's also obviously costs involved and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's not, um, I, yeah, it's not, it's not easy, um, but um, yeah, it doesn't have to be hard either. No, I'd also <laughs> say it's not cheap. Um, uh, no. So um, such su substantial works. I mean, I think uh, we hung uh, 11 really big pieces in, in Ulverston, Tasmania. And uh, I'm just imagining uh, freighting those around because they are beautifully presented requires um, both uh, uh, skill and money. Um, so if you're, I'm, I'm just conscious of the clock here. Um, because yeah. as we all know, Castellaresians always start on time and always finish on time. You can probably hear people laughing in the background at that. Um, but you and I had committed to Lena that we would not be holding uh, the audience up and we would allow time for questions. So um, I think we'll now hand back to Lena to facilitate uh, Q&A from the audience. Thank, Thank you, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was wonderful. Sophie, I, I just am amazed by the work that you've done. It's so intricate and I'm just as excited tonight as the first time I saw it. And uh, the scale of it um, just amazes me, the colours, the story about it, the connection that you've had. Um, I would imagine that blew you away because it's certainly... Um, you do things sometimes and you don't really know the reason, but the outcome of yours was really special to you. But I wanted to ask you um, that with the actual items, I think you mentioned to me that um, you're not selling them at the moment. Is that correct? Yeah, so I, I've, I mean, I get, I've been approached quite a lot to sell. Um, I just got approached again this week. Um, and... Uh, I'm just not ready to sell any individual uh, components of this series of work yet. Um, and part of the reason is because I do want it to travel. Um, oh. and, and so I don't want to break it up. Um, ideally, I wouldn't want to break it up at all. Um, but I have started new work, which is separate to this series, which um, will be for sale at some point. Um, so... Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fundamentally why I haven't sold anything yet is because my dream would be to actually show it on Castel Rizzo. Um, and, uh, but I'd also like to take it um, out of Tasmania. Do you think you've actually got a bit of a, it's like um, your baby at the moment and the story that's behind it, perhaps you've got that emotional connection to them? Yeah, I think there's that, but I, I kind of feel like, that they, I almost feel like that they're, they're, they, are, they are an example of living culture and mm. it's like a, a confirmation or a, it's like, um, you know, with what happened on Castellarizzo with this massive dispersal, you know, through the world and the, and the trauma and the displacement that everyone must have experienced is despite all that, that culture and um, lives on no matter where you are. And it's like um, it affirms that idea, I guess. And, um, and so, yeah, I'd love this series of work to be shown on Castle Rizzo as an example of that. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm reluctant to let go of it. But, yes, I think I am very attached to the, to the work. Um, but at some point, point I'll let it go 
I can fully understand that. It's absolutely beautiful. So what I'd like to open it up to um, the audience tonight to perhaps ask some questions. So you can unmute yourselves now, show your lovely faces and uh, ask Sophie a couple of questions. Happy to answer anything. Can I just start by actually saying it or do you want us to type them up? No, Flora, please just ask okay. the question. Lovely, thank you. Uh, well, I thought your story is absolutely uh, very poignant, Sophie, um, and thank you for sharing it because it's it's obviously very personal. And um, to discover that you're part of this great Castellaresian diaspora, I think must be quite, um, uh, I don't know, what's the word? I don't scary. Scary, <laughs> isn't it? Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I suppose I wonder if you've been to Castellones yet. And do no, I haven't. Uh, I'd love, I'm hoping to go next year. Um, that's what I'd like to do, but I'll just have to see how next year unfolds. But yeah, well, that would be, yeah, I'm, and I'd be really interested to see what kind of impact that has on me and my work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yes, um, it's my highest priority uh, in terms of any travel is to go to the island. Well, I think, you know, obviously it'll be an emotional and uh, rewarding experience. My background is as, as a couple and family therapist, and I'm sure that my background is a Greek, Australian-born Greek, half Kazi, half Xeno, as they say. Some My dad was from another island of the Dolikanisa, but he was given the title of being a, a foreigner because he didn't come from Castellorizo, which is not uncommon. Um, mm -hmm has had a big uh, kind of impact on the profession I chose and the work that I've done. I think the way you've described this kind of unconscious kind of expression of something that's kind of deeply biological around your, your DNA that, you know, you, that was a mystery to you and yet was expressed in, at some level through, um, through your art, I thought was really moving. And um, I'm, I'm very glad that I tuned in to hear it. Um, so I'm really grateful to you to be so generous in both, um, you know, telling us your personal story and sharing this beautiful art. My name's Flora too. So these works obviously are particularly yeah. significant to me personally, but uh, you know, I just think they're beautiful. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, Flora. Hi. Hello. Hello, and hello, Sophie. It's Maria Jetta. I just happen to be visiting Melbourne at the moment. I usually live in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Hello, Lena. Hello. And uh, I was uh, talking to my cousin Connie, and she told me about this um, discussion tonight, and I was fascinated. Um, I actually have three bookla from my great for my grandmother. I have Jeffrey, quite a collection of Kazi clothing from my grandmother, which is all with me over in uh, Switzerland. And I take it out every year per my mother's, my late mother's instructions to take it out and air it. Um, it would be very interesting to talk to you at some stage because I'm worried about the preservation of it. Some of which, it is now. Um, stuck. Which which Connie is your cousin? Connie Gregory. Ah, good. <laughs> Connie Gregory and we Lena is Lena's husband. Peter is my cousin, and Mari Zorbus is my cousin. So I have first cousins to both Connie and to Mari through um, my parents, who were Jim and Mary Demetrius. So, um, yeah, so this was like for me a great opportunity. I mean, I don't very rarely, I very rarely get to connect with the Cassie side of things, Sophie. So I kind of um, I can understand the pull. And this has been wonderful just to be able to talk to people and, and to be a part of this. And I think there is something very deep in your psyche that has brought you through to creating this art. I mean, whether it's the call of the ancestors, I don't know, but. Um, I am a little bit spiritual and I do tend to think things happen for a reason. So, and you are going to just um, add so much to our culture now too, to what you're, do you're doing. I mean, it's going to be taking the word of Castellaris on out literally onto the art world, which is fantastic. So thank you very much for that. And uh, Jeffrey, I don't know how I get in contact with you. Do I do it through the... 
Connie, Connie Gregory. She's yeah, out. Connie. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'll shut up. Thank you. That was yeah. It's really interesting to hear your thoughts. And yes, it's wonderful to um, be connecting with the community. Actually, Sophie, do you mind popping mm -hmm. up the um, the print that you had done? I just would like you to talk a little bit about that. Sure. I actually didn't take it out of the cylinder when I got it. I let the um, art people do that. I was too afraid to tell you the truth, but I'm dying to see it um, actually framed. But if you could just talk us through that, because I know that it's just not a print on paper. Yeah, so, oh, hang on. Sorry, I don't know about, and also, I think it was Mary, the lady who's the, the actual bookler was of, from, I should say. Um. Pat, it was actually Pat Seacoss. Um, can yes. you can you see that? Um, can yes. everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, so this was very kindly lent to me um, to photograph by Pat Seacoss from Sydney. So after Nick's um, fantastic talk in South Australia in 2021, the same week, the Cassidy's and Association of New South Wales opened their um, new club rooms in Sydney. And they were having a special exhibition of traditional women's clothing. And I was like, I have to go. So I went up for the day and I met Pat and, um, and then we've established a friendship. And I asked her, I said, do you think there's anyone that would lend me a bookler to photograph? And she said, no, um, but I will. Um, so it was posted down um, to me in Hobart. And... Um, and uh, there's a person in Hobart who's a brilliant photographer. And so this was did, photographed in a really special way um, to show the detail and get all of it in focus. That's quite a um, tricky thing to do. And it's printed on um, really high quality paper and um, with you know, high quality printing. So it's an absolutely stunning image. Um, and because it's blown up, it really shows the detail of the bookla and in yeah in its beauty and it's a a lovely thing I think to have in anyone's home um, and yeah it's just a beautiful reproduction. Sophie, um, having seen this in real life, um, I could only tell people who are looking on screen this is what we would call museum quality. It, it is um, uh, exceptional quality photography and ex exceptional framing as well. Uh, if you walked into the National Gallery of Victoria, you would not be surprised to see something of, uh, like this, of this quality. Yeah, so it was framed by the pretty much the best framers in Tasmania, Yeah, and he'd be one of the best fine art photographers, reproductive art photographers in Australia. Yes. So we're lucky to have him in Tasmania, and he just lives up the road for me, actually, and his daughter... It's my children. <laughs> it's Tasmania. <laughs> yes. Sophie, I think yeah. we're very, very lucky to have this item as part of our auction on Saturday night. And uh, I know that it's going to go hotly contested because people have been asking me about it. But mm. I've got a couple of things here or um, messages from people that have attended tonight. I just would like to read them out. Um, yeah. This one's from Christine Dimer. And it's a wonderful story of your work and background. We treasure these artefacts of our island. What a special opportunity for us to hear your story. A big thank you from Christine Dimer. And Yvonne Panagakis wanted to know, have you ever, a big thank you to you, Jeffrey and Sophie from Yvonne Panagakis. And have you ever thought of doing miniatures of these exquisite works? Um, does she mean which works? I think the, the floral works, but in miniature. Um, no, I haven't. Um, no, but that's something that I, I actually know it's not true. I'm actually doing one at the moment. <laughs> oh, um, no. But it's not, it's obviously for miniature, it's really small. But, but yeah, no, I'm doing one at the moment that's, that's 50 centimetres, I think it is, or 30. Oh. So, yeah, so I am beginning to work um, at the different scales. So you've started. So I'm also doing. I'm also doing a really big one, 1.2 meters. It's a really ambitious project. Oh, oh. We'll have to which get. Which I plan just to do embroidery. Oh my goodness! And yeah. 
a lady by the name of Felicia Candilli, she said, hi, Sophie, I would like to mention that I just come from Castillorizó one month ago. The colours in your artwork reflects the colours of the buildings on the beautiful island. Um, Micro mu Castillorizó Crisanthi. I hope I pronounced that right. So it's lovely, the messages that uh, everybody's oh, sending nice. you. And I think that tonight, I think um, everybody has been really entertained and delighted by the works that um, you've put together. And I think you've touched our heartstrings as well. So I wanted to thank uh, Jeffrey tonight for your, you know, your generous contribution and certainly Sophie for providing the, um, the booklet print, which I'm dying to see, I'm picking it up tomorrow. And um, for taking the time to really um, go through those exquisite artworks and I hope, in the you know the future, perhaps next year, we get those artworks over to Australia for everyone to see in their entirety, entirety as well. So um, I want to thank you again, and uh, I also this will be the last Kazi Connect that uh, we'll be doing. Um, Kazi Connect was actually born out of um, COVID, and it was really to keep our Castellorizian community together. And myself, the president and the committee have been absolutely delighted to bring it to you. But we conclude with it this, this, uh, this session. And I think we've ended on a really lovely note. I've really enjoyed uh, bringing it to you every month or nearly every month. And certainly we've ended on a high note tonight with Jeffrey and Sophie. So thank you to everyone who's supported the event um, over the last, uh, I think, two years now. And, and it's been an absolute pleasure to bring it to you. And uh, we just need to keep our Cassie connection still together and alive. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you, all participants. If you'd like to, if you'd like to um, stay on and um, have a chat to each other, you're welcome to do that for the next five minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lena, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story. And yeah, I was really looking forward to tonight and meeting you all and uh, yeah, sh sharing my work and the story. And um, Sophie, um, again, I'd like to thank you for creating an opportunity where um, a, a, a new interpretation of our um, cultural heritage um, has been made available to a much wider audience and of course through Cassie Connect um, to our own community so um, thank you and congratulations. Yeah thank you thank you for everything you've done yeah you're, you've been fantastic Jeffrey so well, it's been a pleasure to meet you. A round of support Sophie and keep up the wonderful wonderful yeah, bravo. inspiring well done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll talk to you in the next couple of days, Sophie. Thank you very much. Sure. But I'm do you want me to stick around? I'm happy to stick around or do you want me to go or I'm happy to stay and have a chat, whatever. Yeah, people, if you, you, you're welcome to do that. Um, that's what Cassie Connect was all about. So um, if people would like to stay on and have a bit of a chat, they're most welcome. But um, certainly thank you again, everybody, for the support you've given the uh, Cassie Connect over the last couple of years. It's been a pleasure to bring it to you. And uh, it's over and out from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lena. Thanks, Lena.